welcome everybody to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a great one today with Dr. Nicole Bruno. She is the founder and CEO at Blend.Vet. We are talking about a, uh, a really fascinating uh, program that she did at VMX this year. We were talking about what uh, Blend's uh, DEI certification for veterinary practices looks like. And uh, we talk about how, uh, how our profession is moving forward in increasing the diversity that we have guys um super thought-provoking episode uh nicole is amazing uh you guys are gonna are gonna love meeting her gang um let's get into this episode this is your show we're glad you're here we want to help you in your veterinary career welcome to the cone of shame with dr andy rourke Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nicole Bruno. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It is my pleasure to have you. I, uh, every every year I go to the big conferences, so uh, VMX and Western, and I meet somebody there who blows my mind. And uh, at least one person, sometimes multiple people, but you're that person for me this year. I Aww. was so glad to meet you in person. I am so uh, interested in what you're doing and in the energy that you have. And just, I, I am, I'm so happy to talk to you. And so I appreciate you making time. I, I'll tell people uh, the story of, of how we met. We met at, at VMX and we were at a, um, at a reception and there were a bunch of people there and I had been there for a while. And, uh, and someone was like, Oh, you have to meet Dr. Bruno. You have to meet Dr. Bruno. And I said, Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I, I'd like that. And so I met you and you were amazing. And you were telling me about, uh, it's called a day in veterinary medicine, which is a program that you ran at VMX, which is phenomenal and interesting. And we're going to talk about it in a second, but you were telling me about that. And we were talking. And while we were talking, these other people came over, they stood off to the side, which is not unusual. And I'm just going to be like false modesty aside. It's not unusual for me because people will, especially at receptions of that conferences, you know, people will come up and they'll kind of stand there and they generally like to say hi or that, or I've met them at places before and things like that. So you and I are talking and we kind of come to this natural pause point. And so then I turn to them and I say, hey, and they're like, hey. And then they step like between us with their back to me and they're like, Dr. Bruno, you're amazing. I was in your lectures today and you are incredible. And I, I didn't catch my face in time. So I think I made that what just happened face. Uh, <laughs> I probably have the same face because I'm that... I'm not used to that. I'm like, of course yeah. they're waiting for you. Why would they be waiting for me? I didn't even see them because they were standing behind me. But yeah, that oh. was, I was like, wow, what a way to meet Andy today. <laughs> it, was, I was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Because I was like, oh my God, she's amazing. And other people recognize that she's amazing. Like, I'm clearly late to the game on the Nicole Bruno train. Um, and it's just like, I, I, it was, I was awesome. But the enthusiasm that they had coming up to you and the energy and the questions that they had. And I was just like, oh man, you're doing stuff, Nicole. Like, you're doing stuff that matters that people are getting really excited about. And so I, I left that conversation with such a, a full heart going, this is awesome. And she's doing great things and people are seeing this. And I just, I felt so good talking to you. So that, that just made me so, so happy. And so anyway, I, I really wanted to have you on the, on the podcast and I'm, I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. And like I said, I'm, I think I'm starting to get used to trying to get used to that because it's, it's been like two years of me really pushing this agenda in diversity, equity, inclusion in vet med. And so it's kind of surreal when those moments like that happen. But VMX was definitely, I mean, I know we just started 2023, but it was a fave so far. Um, it was yeah. a really good conference. Well, you got to hold on to that. You know, like like you work so hard. It's so obvious. And I'm going to talk about what you're doing at BlendVet and, and, and your other sort of initiatives that you do. You work so hard. Uh, hold on to that. When people come up and say, man, what you said was really impressive and really important to me and it mattered to me. Like you got to like we call it holding the trophy uh, at, at Uncharted. You know, we, we hold the trophy. So you got to hold, hold that trophy because like you're, you're doing work that's impacting people. So let's let's start off before we start talking about BlendVet. Uh, talk to me about a, a day in veterinary medicine. So so I went there and, and, and I, I hadn't I hadn't heard much about this program. And then in retrospect, I look back and, and I was just fascinated. Can you just lay out, first of all, sort of lay out the idea where it came from and, and then kind of how the event went down? Yeah, sure. So last year, I 2022, I was at VMX and it was the first time that I had been there for a while. So I kind of forgot how large that conference was. And then especially post-COVID, it, it looked a lot larger because we had been hibernating for two years. But I went there and I realized that, you know, this pivot that I was making in my career meant that I was going to be in the speaker circuit a lot more. And VMX is held on MLK weekend every year. And 
And historically, I've done community service during MLK Day because I, I feel it's important. And I realized that I was never going to be home if I was going to be stepping into this speaker circuit and thought about the fact that we were sitting in Orlando during MLK Day and there was an opportunity to give back to the community of Orlando. And for me, pipeline events or programs have always been very important to me. I've wanted to be a vet since I was 12 years old. And even growing up in New York City, there weren't a lot of opportunities for me to pursue or get that exposure representation in veterinary medicine in those young age. And so I thought it was definitely an age group that we needed to target. And I thought about how it would be great if we could bring the students to the conference and let them get a chance to see us in our realm, so to speak, as opposed to me historically going to schools with all of these props for career day. So I just pitched the idea to NABC and I said, let's do a you know, believe and belong in veterinary medicine and let, you know, students in underrepresented areas in Orlando come to the conference. And I will put together a faculty of, you know, amazing veterinarians and technicians throughout all of the, you know, diversity that we offer as, you know, veterinary professionals, dermatology, surgery, emergency medicine, and general practice, and let the students rotate through these workstations, let them hear from us and how our journey was into vet med, let them know that no two journeys are their like. And my younger sister is also a vet. And even growing up in the same household, we have two completely different journeys in vet med. So I, you know, leveraged the team that I have as friends and colleagues, and we put together this program. And then another important part for me was also allowing the parents to see what their role is in supporting students. You know, I don't think I could have made it in this profession without my mom, who really found opportunities for myself and my sister when there were none. And so wanted her and give her her trophy, so to speak. And she spoke with the parents and, you know, let them know, like, this is how we as parents can support students into vet med. What is, uh, what does your sister do? So my sister is a veterinarian. She works for the ASPCA. She does forensics. That's amazing. That's so great. Yeah. Can you, let's, let's start to unpack this a little bit. So I, I'm really interested in the, in the profession as a whole. Pi- a pipeline, um, I mean, diversity pipeline for, for our profession is something I'm, I'm really interested in. I, I think representation is really important. I think it, one of my sort of positions is, is um, if we want to be the trusted voice of pet owners, then we need to represent pet owners and they need to see themselves in us. And, and that's just a, a big part of us being approachable and, and, and building those relationships that we need to have. And so, so representation, I, I think it really matters. Even, even if you zoom all the way into just getting care for pets, like there's, there's a big piece of that there. Can, can you give me your perspective on what sort of the, the pipeline looks like in vet medicine right now and just sort of start to unpack what, where we are in terms of representation in, in the profession? and and how we're doing as far as trying to to increase our diversity. Yes, I could definitely can. So over I'll start where we are currently right now as a whole is according to the US Labor Bureau and Statistics in 2021 we were 93.3% white. Um, less than 2% are Black veterinarians, less than 5% are Latinx, and less than 6% are Asian. So overall, less than 10% of veterinarians are diverse or in as far as racial ethnicity. Sure. So when we think about how does that go backwards into the veterinary schools currently, we're still not seeing, although we've had an increase of applicants of I'll say the word BIPOC, but it's Black, Indigenous, people of color. We've seen an increase in those applicants, but we're still not seeing overall an increase in the representation of veterinary students. So according to the AAVMC in 2024, we were still about 75% white as far as veterinary students. So then we go back further into the pipeline where we're going into colleges And at a time, and again, these numbers are not new, like this has been going on since I was in vet school, but currently, you know, we are going to see a dip from the pandemic. We've seen a lot of students that have had to, you know, drop out of school, you know, especially look for due to socioeconomics or, you know, Mm -hmm. there has been an increase in BIPOC students that haven't been able to remain in undergraduate enrollment and men. So again, you know, in a profession that's predominantly women, that's another factor that hits us from a level of diversity. So we have, you know, we're seeing this in real time happening. And of course, if these students are not in the undergraduate pipeline, they certainly aren't going to be applying to vet school, which is going to further widen that gap. Um, So pretty much pipeline development is kind of understanding that we need to 
find the source of where the problem is. And it's really in all the stages of the pipeline, because when you go backwards, even to high school or even into, you know, junior high school age years, there's a problem with students may not be able to get at jobs or get opportunities to get exposure in junior high school to stay in the pathway into vet med. Their high schools may not have support in as far as programming for them to be exposed to agricultural programs or veterinary medicine in high school. So then when they get to college, they have no idea about what it, it takes to be a veterinarian, how to start. And, you know, some of the we know that you can major in anything and get into veterinary school. We're asking these students to dig deeper and see that they can be a psychology major and then go to vet school, too. Like so the opportunities to support students in every stage of the pipeline is critical if we're really going to be intentional about seeing our demographics change. And historically, we haven't been. And that's why I'm really trying to shift the conversation to what can we do and take advantage of the things that we already do well at. We have conferences every year, multiple conferences. There's an opportunity for us, especially when we you know, are in the same city every year to really start a program that allows students to grow with us and see how they develop into our profession. Even if they decide vet med isn't for them, that's a win too, right? Because we want us, we want people to really know and, and want to join this profession. But the hope is, is that by not only exposing them and then showing them what support can look like, because there's so many people doing amazing work at, you know, for Pipeline that I'm still learning to this day. And it's a great way to highlight where those places are to be able to, you know, guide these these students to to find them and, and continue their journey into vet med. Yeah, I, I love your I love your focus on pipeline and it, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Can you go ahead and let's step sort of to the side for a moment. When, when I when I sort of brought you on, I, I introduced you as amazing. Uh, but but I didn't lay down the fact that you know you're you're a practicing veterinarian. You've been a veterinarian for uh, 16 years. Uh, you graduated uh, pretty much when I did uh, from school and um you uh god you were you were a busy you're a, you're a busy person so you uh you you practice you um you are a member of the Cornell University Advisory Council you serve on the advisory board for Pause Abilities which is a mentorship platform you're a facilitator for MentorVet which is uh the company that uh, Dr. Addie Reinhardt runs and I'm I'm a huge fan of hers you just do all of these things uh and and you're also the CEO and founder of BlendVet and I want to start to talk about BlendVet a little bit. And so so these are all the things you're doing. And, and you have this emphasis on, on pipeline, which I, th- I think is amazing. I want to come back to in a moment. Can you step over just to the side for a second and talk to me a little bit about BlendVet and what your company does, um, wh- what you do over there? So <laughs> so a lot of what I, my goal with starting BlendVet was to create a veterinary hospital certification program in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that stemmed from seeing, being a veterinary leader, because I I used to manage veterinary hospitals and seeing the values that leadership can display to kind of create environments of inclusion in vet med and realizing that if we are good as a hospital culture, that just mirrors into how we interact with the community. So I felt like that was a way for me to really bring in and emphasize that training in DEI needs to be for all roles in a hospital because we all contribute to culture. When I started to talk more about the the reasons why we needed to improve our culture, why we needed to focus on all the roles in the hospital getting this training and creating a certification so that not only can our clients see that, hey, that's a blend vet certified hospital. I know that I could be welcomed there, but also mm-hmm. our future colleagues as they're joining or even people that are looking for jobs as we speak know that they can find a place a, or a workplace that they can thrive in. And that was very important to me because I had been seeing, you know, so much of burnout from my colleagues. And I remember times in my career where I was burnt out and it was usually when I didn't feel included, where I didn't feel like I belonged or I fit into places. And a lot of those stemmed from, you know, usually being the only person of color in that practice. You know, I'm biracial. Mm -hmm. My mom is black and my father's Colombian. So I used to, you know, struggle on both sides when I would see our inability to engage with our clients because we didn't speak the language. And I would try my best to speak as fluent in Spanish as I can. Um, but also just seeing the disconnect in how we engage with our clients of color and wanting to do more. And so my goal with BlendVet was to create that opportunity so that we could learn how to 
be better together, but also be better for our clients. And when I started talking about BlendVet more and more and more, my door opened more in veterinary students. You know, academia asked me to come and talk more about it. And I started to hear more from the vet students that these were topics that weren't discussed in vet school. And these were this was information they wanted. These were experiences that they had already witnessed, you know, either from their experience hours getting into vet school or as they were navigating clinical years. And in my mind, when I created BlendVet, I knew that I wanted to go backwards into vet school but I needed to stay in the lane that I had been in for 17 years, which was practicing medicine. And so I started there. But when the vet school doors opened, I, I jumped in there. And, you know, now we've started to do training within certain veterinary schools, whether it be their faculty training or the veterinary students themselves through lectures. And we are also, you know, still proceeding with our hospital certification program as well, which is what we're starting this quarter. We're going to be working with Rare Breed Veterinary Partners, and I'm really excited. We start next that's month. Awesome. And so, you know, it's a I, when you say I'm busy, I'm like, oh, that's an understatement because yeah. it's like I am. It's 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 surreal because this is what I've wanted and it's happening yeah. in real time. And I'm like, I'm excited. I'm excited well, yeah. for what it can bring. And then the pipeline was just literally the cherry on top. That pipeline event was everything. Oh, yeah. So this is, I am, you just get me so excited, but also tired. You get me excited and tired. Because <laughs> I'm tired, I, I, yes. <laughs> I, well, of course you are. Like the, you, you're, you're doing, you're working across, the, it's a massive, it's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. And, and you, you have integrated yourself into all these different places. And, and just in our short conversation, you know, you can already see how you're putting the pieces together, which is, which is why I think you're so fascinating. And, and I just, I'm such a big fan of what you're doing, but, but you, you're like, okay, well, obviously we start at the pipeline and we talk about bringing people in and then when they, when we need to attract these people and we need to retain these people and we need to make sure these people succeed and grow. And so, so we're starting to figure out how do, how do we adapt culture that we have, which is a white culture, you know, uh, how do we, how do we adapt, uh, adapt that so that it is inclusive and people can feel comfortable and they want to be a part of, of the culture that we have. And, and so you're, you're just, you're, you're laying down all of these pieces and it's really this, uh, sort of ecosystem of how the individual pieces kind of click together and work. But, but you're clearly, you've clearly thought about this a lot as far as where are the biggest priorities and, and what needs to happen in order to, to build long-term success. And so I just, I love, I love how you think. I love how strategic you are about this. And I, and I just, I love the fact that you're, you're very action oriented. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that, that you're working with students and that they, they, they really want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. It's been very, very rewarding working with the students. They're a reminder, right? Of where, of what we want. Aren't they wonderful? Yeah, yeah they are. Hey guys, I just want to hop in really quick and give a quick plug. The Uncharted Veterinary Conference is coming in April. Guys, I founded the Uncharted Veterinary Conference in 2017. It is a one-of-a-kind conference. It is all about business. It is about internal communications, working effectively inside your practice. If you're a leader, that means you can be a medical director. It means you can be an associate vet who really wants to work well with your technicians. It means you can be a head technician, a head CSR. You can be a practice owner, practice manager, multi-site manager multi-site uh, medical director. We work with a lot of those people. This is all about building systems, setting expectations to work effectively with your people. Guys, Uncharted is a peer mentorship conference. That means that we come together and there is a lot of discussion. We create a significant percentage of the uh, schedule, the agenda at the event, which means we're going to talk about the things that you are interested in. Uh, it is, all, as I said, business communication focused, but uh, lots of freedom inside that to make sure that you get to talk about what you want to talk about. We really prioritize people being able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, to pick people's brains, to get advice from people who have wrestled with the problems that they are currently wrestled with. We make all that stuff happen. If you want to come to a conference where you do not sit and get lectured at, but you work on your own practice, your own challenges, your own growth and development. That's what Uncharted is. Take a chance. Give us, uh, give us a look. Come and check it out. It is in April. I'll put a link in the show notes for registration. Um, ask anybody who's been. It's something special. All right, let's get back into this episode. I, I, the vet students are always. I, I I get so energized when I work with vet students because they're they're excited about a profession. You know that the, they see these endless possibilities and and they're just they're they're ready to, they're ready to go and they they want to they want to change the world and change our profession. And just I I just I always leave the vet school so so fired up because they're just they're they're inspiring in in their you know fresh fresh eyed look at, at what we're doing and they just remind you kind of how awesome our yeah. profession is. So. Can, 
can you talk a little bit about this? I want to hear more about the certification. So, so you say we talk about, you know, uh, having all roles in the hospital, uh, trained in, um, in, uh, in, in sort of DEI. Talk to me about what that looks like. So if, if a practice owner sort of said to you, Hey, you know, I'm interested in this. Help me understand what my people would learn. What, what is, what is valuable knowledge for them even look like? Because most of us, never had anything like this we, we we don't really know what that what that is so can you start to help me help me see that picture sure can so first thing that i felt was really really important was having it on an lms where we had an opportunity to take it at our own pace because we're busy and so we can't really it's really hard to collaborate you know get everybody in the hospital together at the same time it's like i remember having lunch and learns and like right when the the rep is about to start you have that emergency come in or the phone call so it's really hard to have that you know timed learning opportunities so they will be asynchronous modules through our lms but before that, we have um, our hospitals take a, our blend vet culture assessment, and we have developed an art to what we think would be the right way to assess culture in, from a hospital's perspective, but any workplace, actually. And then once we get the culture assessment, then we meet with the leadership team and we present the results and we kind of create a workshop of like, this is some areas that we feel need to be focused on. We really need to emphasize training. And it might be, we need to be better at knowing what our biases are. We may need to to look at allyship a little bit better. So that's the way that we can get live training, right? And then just kind of get that um, connection with them, understand maybe stories or situations that have happened to really feel like they're not in this alone. And then afterwards, we introduce the staff and with now the leadership knowing their role in supporting their staff through their LMS. And they will go through modules under each element or value of blend. So I didn't really mention what blend stood for. It's not an acronym, but the blend itself stands for the values of what I feel create a, a great hospital culture. That's one of inclusivity. So B stands for building relationships. So how do we build these relationships with our team? Realizing communication looks different. How do we lead? So leadership, leading with empathy, with vulnerability, which I felt was very, very important, especially during the pandemic. It was a skill that not every leader had, and it definitely drove the difference in how cultures, you know, responded or how, you know, our staff responded. Education and equity stand are the ease. So understanding that we need to create equitable environments, but also we need to constantly seek education. It's not a one and done. DEI is constantly evolving. And so understanding that this is an opportunity to take that first step into the journey of DEI. N stands for navigating the unknown. So those are the things that everybody just wants to avoid. And unfortunately, those are the things that really start the toxicity in a hospital culture, the things that we avoid. So how do we ha handle difficult conversations? How do we handle when current events are going on and they're affecting groups of people that, you know, we don't even know how to start having those conversations. But if there's a foundation of trust, if we've had that relationship, it's easier to have those conversations. And then D stands for diversity, inclusion, and belonging. It's understanding that all of those pieces is what helps not only create an environment where we feel safe to come to work, but we perform better. We thrive better. We, we get things done faster together. And so all of those elements have modules. So all the values have modules underneath them. And what I've been doing over the last two years is really identifying people in the industry that are passionate about DEI, but speak to a certain topic related to those modules. So we have the, you know, great Mia Carey that talks about allyship, you know, and she's the um, CEO of Pride VMC, you know, so she really he lays the foundation of what that looks like as an ally. But we also have people of the LGBTQ plus community talking about what it's been like to be in their shoes. Um, one of a module that went really well um, in our academic um, launch was our module with um, Christina Wetzel. And she spoke about what it's been like to be deaf in our profession. And not only as a technician, but now as a veterinary student and ultimately what it will be like as a veterinarian. And so the, what I've found is, is that when we need to learn about DEI, yes, the definitions matter, but how they make people feel, the application part, the lived experiences, that's what you don't get from reading in a textbook. Well, how did this apply to, uh, how does this apply to my life and how can we make it better so that we don't have others in our hospitals or as our clients feel this way? And so when I speak, I usually lean on, you know, experiences that I've had happen to me where you know, I've been marginalized or a client didn't want me to do surgery and what that 
felt like, but also, you know, Mm -hmm. put it back on what should leadership have done in this moment? What should we as a hospital have done or had in place so that our colleague didn't feel marginalized or that we wouldn't allow this client to come back through our door again? Or what do we have in place so these clients know this is not the way to behave because we're not going to tolerate it? These are all the things that my hope is Blend will have people start thinking about. My goal is not to tell you how to run your hospital, but it's to give you that framework, those bones so that you create your blueprint of like, this is the communities that we work with. This is what we don't have. We need to hire to create, to fill in that that gap so that there are no language barriers. So that's the purpose of Blend. So they go through these modules. There's reflective activities. There's opportunities for the hospital to, you know, partner with Blend to have a facilitated conversation to kind of really tie in the module together. And then to become certified, we ask hospitals to do some community service, which is why the pipeline Mm -hmm. events really are helpful for me to let them see how we can do that very easily. But also internally, what are you going to do in your hospital to make it better for your your staff, you know, for your clients that come into your doors? Um, And that can be what they deem is is the next best step for them. But putting that all together and really making a commitment to that educational process and that evolution and and then actually creating the actionable step, because I mean, you're very you're correct in that. I'm very action oriented. Doing yeah, that love step it. is what makes you a more of a blend certified hospital and because you're taking the next step. Well, as you as you lay this out, the the commitment to service and you you and I talked about that when, when we first met and you mentioned about about service and, and how it and how it fit into your your dream for blend as well. And and we start with this conversation in the pipeline and then we go with and we talked about service and then how that feeds back into this pipeline and go. God, Nicole, you built this beautiful thing. Like it just it it makes it makes sense and it works. And it's just I'm just anyway. I keep <laughs> I keep saying how impressed I am. Well, it's, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. So let me let me ask you this. So so we've talked about sort of we already kind of sprawled across the you know every aspect of practice from you know recruiting at the undergraduate and pre undergraduate levels all the way up to practice leadership. And it's like this is this is a, a broad swath here. So it's clear that you think it at a high level and you think about the profession as a whole. If you were queen of veterinary <laughs> medicine for a day, what 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 would you what would sort of what would be your um what would be your words to the profession? Like, so kind of, kind of like a magic wand and say, what would you like to see? How, how, again, magic wand in hand, how would you love to see our profession sort of mobilize in order to increase diversity, equity, inclusion? Are are there specific steps or areas that you say, I would love for us to focus on these areas or to see these types of actions? What, What would that look like? I mean, I think it's a combination of, of the training part of, of wanting to be better for who who we're serving right now. But I also think it's a part Mm -hmm. of understanding that, you have to give back. And I, I know that it's hard for us sometimes because we are very, we're pet centric, right? We are veterinarians. We want mm-hmm. to take care of the animals, but the pe- the animals belong to the people. And if the people aren't on board mm-hmm. in connecting with us or understanding the health concerns of, of the patient, we're not getting the compliance and the pet is not getting better. So it, it, it's it's a whole, you know, circle of life, so to speak. For me, I, I want my colleagues to, you know, Again, like I said, I'm not trying to tell them what to do, but I want to give them opportunity to fit in with what makes sense. What's your niche? You know, some people are really great with working with younger kids. You know, there are programs that exist for K through four. You know, there's programs for junior high school age. There's programs for high school. You know, challenge your veterinary schools or what are we doing to improve pipeline? You know, do we have a program in place? How can I help? You know, possibilities. You mentioned I'm on the advisory board. Like it's a great opportunity for people that may not have the time to show up during the day, but it's a way to virtually support a student that might want to enter it. I think that if I could challenge, if I could wave my magic wand, it would be to ignite, you know, in all of my colleagues, an opportunity to do be of service, not just for what we do daily, but to like think about the pipeline and think about the future of our profession. And I know, and that's like I said, it, it, it looks differently for different people depending on their skill set. Mine is definitely, you know, pipeline development, 
my sister, just to mm. throw her out there, she, you know, is very passionate about access to care. You know, that's been her her mm. pathway into vet med with the ASPCA. And so I tell her all the time, you know, when you're finished with your master's program, come on down and let's create an access to care, you know, p- event for it. Yeah. But the point is, is that we all have an opportunity to step into that service, you know, mindset and give back. And I think that that's ultimately what I would do if I was queen of vet med for the day. I love it. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit more about Plausibilities. It's not a group I know a whole lot oh, about. Oh, yeah. Well, you you should totally have Dr. Marcano on. Um, but Valerie Marcano is um, someone that I feel like we probably are sisters, um, but we have a lot of, um, she actually knows my sister. So we call ourselves sisters, but she went to Cornell for undergrad and went to Georgia. And during the, they had a hackathon at Georgia and her and her husband, who was the co-founder for Plausibilities, they um, pitched a virtual platform opportunity for underrepresented students to learn about, you know, veterinary medicine and all of the ways to support them through pipeline development. So it's an opportunity. If you wanted to join Possibilities, you could go to Possibilities Vet Med and at vetmed.com. And there's a way that you can sign up as a mentor or you can be a mentee. But if you either way, you would be having to take a about an hour and a half um, course in what is the role of a mentor? What is the role of a mentee? What are barriers that students that are underrepresented may encounter? So you that you have a little bit more knowledge base about it. And then once you've, you know, passed the test and, and you're in, you're it's almost like a another social media group where you can see what other students, they can ask questions. There might be somebody in Alaska saying, I really want to do marine biology. How do I start? You know, and somebody that is in that industry can come in and, you know, kind of counsel them offline, like on an email, or they can connect with that person and really start a relationship th- that consists of a mentoring mentee type of relationship. So it's allowed me sometimes I've had students reach out to me to ask me about things, you know, knowing that I'm from New York, you know, what opportunities or what high mm-hmm. school, um, what hospitals did you shadow at? And sometimes I'm like, well, you know what, I have a sister who's a vet that lives in New York, so I can connect you with her. So sometimes it's I, I'm a connector. And sometimes I'm giving the advice. But especially during the pandemic where people couldn't get experience hours at hospitals, it was a way to support students that really didn't know where to start. You know, they were isolated from school. They didn't know what to do. So it was a way for us. And Possibilities does sometimes monthly workshops to kind of help students with the application of ed school or just scholarship opportunities. So either way, it's just a way for us to give back if we don't have the time as far as like showing up at an event, but we can do it off hours because you can always answer an email at any time. Oh, yeah. That's great. Uh, where can people find more about you? Where can they more uh, learn more about BlendVet? So definitely head to my my website, um, www.blend.vet. We have so many opportunities for you to learn more about the program, but also just, you know, the resources that I have felt during my journey into this DEI space of what's helped me, certain books, certain podcasts. So it's a way that we've just tried to condense that information. And if anyone is interested in become or you know learning more about the hospital certification program or just outside speaking events, we can always sign up on our wait list and then somebody will get out back to you. But we are hoping to continue our work showing up at conferences and, you know, providing some DEI content there. So that's another way to meet us as well. That's fantastic. Dr. Nicole Bruno, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all the work that you are doing in our profession. I am so glad I got to meet you and talk with you. Uh, I can't wait to uh, to get to talk with you more in the future. Yes. Guys, thanks for uh, tuning in today. Thank you so much for having me. And that is what I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks a lot to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Bruno for being here. I'll put a link to blend.vet down in the show notes. So you guys can check that out. As always, if you liked it, if you got something out of this episode, please leave me an honest review wherever you get podcasts or share it with your friends. I always just want to try to get the word out and help people, you know, um, help people find the work that we're doing here on the Cone of Shame. But anyway, guys, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you later on.